Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to our graduating seniors and our parents. Wow, what an honor. Uh, during the next few minutes, I shall speak about public scholarship, service learning, and about the duty that we bear to the society that so generously supports us. In the year 2000, as chair of the Kellogg Commission on the Future of State and Land Grant Universities, President Graham Spanier spoke of the need for engagement. Engagement is the collaboration between institutions of higher education and communities for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources. In an engagement project, we bring the university's resources to bear on a significant issue, but learn from and are changed by what our community partners know and share with us. Indeed, this kind of reciprocal service to the community has been a long and proud tradition at Penn State through agricultural cooperative extension and outreach. Today, that tradition has expanded beyond agriculture to almost every college of this university and is best seen in the projects of the Laboratory for Public Scholarship and Democracy that commit students and faculty to civic engagement through teaching, research, and service. The idea of public scholarship can be best explained by starting by stating two basic purposes of a college degree. The first, a degree confers knowledge and skills that allow one to be gainfully employed, to get a job. Uh, second, a degree helps undergraduates to be good citizens by using their knowledge to make the world a better place. Both of these purposes noble as they are, assume that the university produces straightforward knowledge that can be directly employed for the social good. That assumption is not always correct. I believe a university education can serve a third purpose, to, to create a space for imagination, to challenge traditional understanding of complex problems and discover new and different solutions. I shall explore this critical element of a great education by drawing on the work of a Penn State project that Dean Easterling referred to. Uh, it's called Rethinking Urban Poverty, the Philadelphia Field Project. And that's a course that I run in West Philadelphia. It began in 1988 as a service learning project offered by Penn State, and we've run that for almost 10 years in a West Philadelphia neighborhood called Parkside. West Philadelphia is struggling. There are too many folks there for whom life is very hard. Now, people are said to be poor when they don't have enough money for a decent standard of living. Using that measure, the Census Bureau estimates that over 12% of the US population is poor. And in West Philadelphia, that number is over 22%. The, the conventional answer to such poverty is more economic growth, more jobs, higher income. And these are ideas that have been widely circulated through official reports and research journals and the media. But this old solution of creating good jobs and higher income is not working in West Philadelphia, where the levels of unemployment and poverty have remained quite high over the years. In a global economy where American labor has to compete with low wages in third world countries, it is difficult to see how we can create good jobs that pay workers 20 to $25 an hour. I don't think that's possible anymore. The case of West Philadelphia is particularly interesting because it is like a tale of two cities. It's very puzzling because it is the home to three universities, several hospitals, the Philadelphia Zoo, the Fairmont Park, and a well-funded federal empowerment zone. But nevertheless, there are neighborhoods like Belmont and Mantua where the poverty rates are unacceptably high. There is no obvious economic answer to the plight of the poor in West Philadelphia. If there is no economic answer, then I ask, why do we insist on describing it as an economic problem? So I need to invoke one term from philosophy that we call epistemology. Epistemology is a kind of a big word to say, how do we know what we know? How do we know that? Now, working in West Philadelphia, I began to realize that academic disciplines such as geography, economics, and sociology 
the manner in which they frame issues, in this particular case, poverty, has become a causative agent of the very problem that we wish to solve. And that is a tragic irony. But there's hope for these so-called intractable issues of the day. What we do in the world depends a lot on how we imagine that world. If we conceptualize poverty as an economic problem, then clearly we are forced to find an economic answer. So, imagining the world of the poor outside the strict box of economics, what the Philadelphia Field Project did was to ask the following question. Is it possible to improve the quality of life among community residents when we know for sure that new jobs and more money may not be the answer? Let me repeat that. Is it possible to improve the quality of life among community residents when we know that new jobs and more money may not be the answer? Is that possible? I mean, can we do that? My answer to that question is a resounding yes. Yes, we can. I acknowledge these words are borrowed. I should do that. Uh, but I deeply believe in my heart that the university does have the power to meet that challenge. And now we have the intellect and the evidence to prove that. This is not a question of money. It is a matter of integrating vision, research, teaching, and service. In a word, public scholarship. So let me elaborate this idea a little bit more. The concept of poverty is an academic abstraction. It groups together a myriad different material, social, and mental conditions, diseased bodies, substandard houses, boarded up and empty homes, abandoned, rubble-strewn, vacant lots, unsafe street, latchkey kids, long commutes, single-parent families, mental stress, feelings of lack induced by endless exposure to commercial advertising. The list goes on and on. It does not help to conceptually group all of that together and call it poverty when we know there is no grand answer to that, certainly not in economics. By grouping a number of very disparate things, what we have done is we have created this vast meta-narrative, this, this, this impregnable rock of Gibraltar in whose presence we feel totally powerless. So here's an example then where our own intellect has robbed us of agency and destroyed the power we possess to act in the world. Power is simply the ability to act. Now it turns out that power can take two forms, what's called sovereign power and non-sovereign power. Sovereign power is that which is possessed by the state. It is deployed by kings and presidents, prime ministers, the Congress, the city hall, and it's best exemplified in Thomas Hobbes's The Leviathan. Non-sovereign power is that which is possessed by all of us, you and me. It gives us power to act in the world through our knowledge, through skills, competencies, and memberships in organization. So the non-sovereign power is fundamental to the way the Philadelphia Field Project thinks about poverty. Over the years, as I worked in West Philadelphia, the people in that community helped us to identify three concepts, three concepts that they care about the most. Health, dignity, and community. So instead of asking why poor households don't make more money, what the Philadelphia Field Project asks is, why do these households have problems with health and nutrition and housing? We ask the question, what does it take to live in a healthy body? What does it take to live and love and die with dignity? What does it take to live in a supportive community? With the help of our community partners, we discovered that there is really no large single economic condition called poverty, which can be corrected through poverty policy. Since 1998, in collaboration with our community partners, Penn State students have implemented a series of academic and practical projects related to topics such as community credit, urban gardening, nutrition, access to public transport, safe streets, youth esteem, uh, youth sex education, and internet marketing of inner city product. In each case, the student was challenged to find agency within his or her academic major at a scale which is correlated to the power that they possess in the world at a scale that is correlated to the power that they possess in the world. That is non-sovereign power. 
Through the project, our students undertake research activities to improve health through diet, nutrition, and exercise, urban gardens, community-supported agriculture, and education for preventive health care, and targeting specific challenges such as type 2 diabetes and hypertension. So once the understanding of poverty is transformed in this manner, the link between the university and the community becomes obvious. The university, in my mind, is one of the most important institutions in the world. For it alone, for it alone has the capacity to challenge our imagination. It alone has the vast reserves of skills and competencies and personnel. And it alone, through its colleges, departments, and institutes, has a unique organizational structure to deploy non-sovereign power to make the world better. It is almost as if there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the university and the world that we live in. I have never in my life felt more hopeful about the power I possess as a teacher to harness the limitless non-sovereign power that we have in the university, in our student body, and in our faculty. We extend the lessons learned from this project to other topics such as conflict resolution, that's our plan, peace and preservation of the environment. And I predict that theories of non-sovereign power will transform the university of the 21st century into a powerhouse of social innovation. To those of you who are graduating today, I invite you to please reflect on the relationship between your major and the power you possess to act in the world. And graduate school might just be the place to get a better understanding of the issues that I have raised today. And remember that your civic duties, your civic duties do not end with casting a vote and sending a contribution to a party of your choice. Your civic duty should be exercised every day in a routine manner and draw constantly on what we have taught you. And a final word to the parents who are here. Thank you very much for trusting your children's education with us. I join you in celebrating their success. Perhaps you have other children planning to go to college. Tell them to think about Penn State, where making life better is not just a slogan. It is a central part of our intellectual mission. And one more thing, I challenge you, and I'm talking to the parents, I challenge you to think about your own personal power to improve the world. I don't know how close you are to retirement, but if you are, consider State College as a place to retire. Why not take a course or two in public scholarship? Why not, why not come here and exercise your non-sovereign power? We'd love to work with you on project. Yeah? Thank you.